This is Real Estate Rookie episode 110. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with Tony Robinson, and today is a rookie reply. We have pulled a question from Facebook for you guys uh, that we are going to go over. Tony, what is today's question? All right. So today's question is, and I'll have to look up who it's from. It's from Rhett Miller, um, but Rhett's posted in the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. How do you inform an inherited tenant of changes in ownership after you close on a property? So... Uh, All of my long-term rentals, they came vacant, uh, right? I bought them vacant, then we rehabbed them. So I've I've never actually had to deal with inheriting someone else's tenant. So Ashley, the queen of property management, tell us your your experience. What do you think of this? I'm not sure if I actually hold that title, but um, (laughs) between me and you, I will take it. (laughs) So the first thing is uh, something that can come up is when an investor or anybody is selling a property, they may not want the tenants to know that they are selling. Uh, So I have a property under contract right now and the owner does not want the tenants to know because of fear that they're just going to stop paying rent or I don't know what bad things he thinks will happen, but he doesn't want them to know. But the first thing you should do is try to negotiate with the seller that you can send estoppel agreements to the tenants. And this would be for you, the, before you even close on the property. So this could be done during your due diligence period where you're sending them a sheet of paper and it basically you know, has them put their name, their lease terms, such as what are they paying for rent? Um, do they have any pets? When does their lease expire? Uh, do they do the snow plowing and landscaping or is that you know not included? So there's different things um, that you want to ask on this form, but it's things basically you're verifying their lease agreement and then asking other conditions to, you know, what utilities are they paying? Uh, It's just giving you that um, check that whatever the landlord is saying and is the same as what the tenant is saying. And another big one too is the security deposit. Make sure they're both on the same page about the security deposit. It definitely helps if you're getting copies of the lease agreements so you can, you know, make sure what they're saying is true because basically you're really going off the lease agreement and not really what anyone said. But a lot of times these mom and pop landlords, they don't have lease agreements. It can be, you know, just a verbal agreement or no detail at all in the lease. So that's a great time to send these estoppel agreements so that, you know, you're on the same page. And then as far as when you purchase the property, so you at least want to let them know the day of when you close, when you have taken over uh, ownership of the property. And a great way to do that is to put something in writing. Uh, so that could be, you could be dropping these off at the doors. You could be um, mailing them out so that they arrive the day you close. But I think a, a great way is to actually, um, you know, tape it to their door, hand deliver them so you know that they're getting and then send another copy verif- or certified mail or something like that. If it's um, a property that has some common areas, you can post, uh, you know, like a notice, you know, here's the the new owner's information. This is how you contact them. This is what you do for maintenance, different things like that. But I really like to put everything in writing. I'm pretty sure if they try and call the other landlord, the other landlord's not going to answer because they're not the landlord. They don't have to deal with that property or they will and they will just forward on to your information. One thing you might not want to happen, which has happened to me, is one tenant did not receive um, my information correctly and the owner gave them my personal cell phone number and I have always used a Google Voice number. Uh, So there was a a little mix up there, which can be avoided with providing your information right at closing as soon as you um, take over the property. So what other things am I missing that you'd want to know, Tony? Yeah, no, the, the, so much good information there. So with this estoppel agreement, um, what happens if there's no lease in place, right? Say this super mom and pop, like you said, it's all verbal. When you go out and try and fill out this estoppel agreement, what if they're like, we never talked about any of these things? Um, can you force a new lease on that tenant if since they haven't signed one or what's like the, and this will probably vary state to state, but at least where you're at, like what's the process if there is no lease? 
Yeah. So if there's no lease, then they're considered month to month. Um, and you, but you still have to give them notice if you're going to increase the rent. So I don't know offhand what it is, but in New York state, it's something like if they've lived there less than a year, you give 30 day notice. If they've lived there less than two years, you give 60 day notice. And anything beyond that, I think it's 90 day notice maybe. So you would have to follow uh, rules like that. Um, so if the day you're closing, you could also negotiate in your contract with the seller that they give notice to the tenants so that, you know, in New York state, it takes 30 to 90 days to close on a property anyway. So you could always negotiate that they're giving notice uh, for that rent increase to cover some of that time period too. And then do you, do you like actually shake hands and introduce yourself when you buy a new property or is it just like mailing them the, uh, the information, the estoppel agreement or the, the new leases? Yeah. I've always just mailed uh, in the very beginning when I only had a, a couple properties, I was there working on the properties and I was there for the showings and things like that. And they would know that I was the owner. But other than that, um, after that, I tried to see myself more as the the property manager than as the owner. And I would um, it, mail things and try to limit as much time as I, so I didn't have to go to the property as often. But Have you ever had any issues um, trying to enforce new leases with some of the inherited tenants? No, not really, because something I will do, there was this woman that had lived in her apartment for 30 years. It was a two bedroom, one bath. Everybody else was paying $500 a month, which was still below market. And she was paying $300 a month. Wow. So what I did with her was I did um, a gradual increase. So I think it over six months, we increased it to, I think, 425 because she was the only one paying her own water. Uh, but to kind of even it out. So I try to work with people to do it that way instead of just like, oh, you know, you're <laughs> next month, your rent's increasing to mm -hmm. by $125. And then I'll also do uh, comparables. I'll show them that I'm actually bringing their rent up to market rent. So I do a letter that states um, comparables in the area. So like this apartment is listed online for this amount of rent. It's the same as yours, two bedrooms, one bathroom, the same amount of upgrades to it. And this one is 800 a month and I'm offering, you know, you still 750 or something like that. So I try and show them that I am not being unfair. I'm not being outrageous. I'm just, they've gotten a great deal for so long and I'm just bringing it up to market rents. Last question. Do you, do you often have tenants vacate uh, when they get the notice of the rent increases or would you say maybe it's like 50, 50, I really don't have anyone that has vacated. I don't think because of a rent increase ever actually, because I try and do it so fairly where it's not a huge amount. Um, but no, I haven't, I haven't dealt with that. Man, well, you made, you made it sound good, easy. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you made it sound super easy. I mean, I still have had vacancies where I get people to leave, but never for a rent increase, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I would just think, you know, maybe maybe that's part of Rhett's logic here as well as like, you know, hey, if I if I buy this place and then I try and increase the rents, am, am I going to end up with four empty units? You know, but it sounds like as long as he does it in a kind of fair and consistent manner, hopefully it's not too much of an issue. Yeah. And it also takes time for people to find housing too. Um, so it's probably wouldn't be immediate because they have to give you notice that they're going to be leaving um, mm -hmm. and the chances of them all leaving. Um, but also you can, you can do a walkthrough with them and say, you know, I would like to increase the rent to this. And maybe there's a couple things they would like done in the property that you can show like, okay, I'm going to fix this for you. Make this nice. And your rent is going to go up to this. Um, so definitely communicating with your tenants and listening to them, just like we always talk about with a seller, like, why are they selling? Same with a tenant. Why would they want to move? Why do they want to stay? Things like that, especially your first property. Yeah. Well, love it, Ash. I feel like we hit Rhett's question or if not, we, I did no heavy lifting in this episode, but <laughs> you I, feel like you, questions, though. <laughs> I feel like you, you answer Rhett's question so well. So I don't know any, any final closing thoughts. No, I don't think so. Um, thank you for um, interviewing me for this episode. <laughs> Do my best Oprah impression today. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for listening to today's Rookie Reply. 
I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we can't wait to see you guys in New Orleans at the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Conference. 